13, it gives an overview of what Pan-Africanism is, written by uh, Sid LaMail, okay, Pan-Africanism for Beginners. All right, now, when was Kwanzaa created, okay? Uh, Kwanzaa was created in 1996 uh, by Dr. Milana Karenga and the organization Us in the midst of the Black Freedom Movement, it reflects a concern for cultural groundedness in thought and practice. Now, this is Dr. Milana Karinga here. He's, he's uh, the chair and a professor at the uh, of, of, uh, professor of Africana Studies at California State University, Long Beach, California. Okay. Now, uh, I've done a lot of research, different sources, official website here, uh, the organization Us's uh, official website, also numerous articles, and a lot of people say that Dr. Milana Karinga created. Kwanzaa, but if you go to the organization US website, uh, now this is the official organization that uh, are the custodians of Kwanzaa, and on the on their website on the home page, if you click on history, and it gives history of the organization, they also say that they created Kwanzaa, not Dr. Milana Karinga by himself. He was a co-creator of Kwanzaa. So I think it's important to note that and honor those other people who were co-creators uh, as well. Okay. Uh, now Kwanzaa was created to serve multiple purposes and to address specific problems that African people were dealing with in America in 1966 when it was founded. Okay. So it was founded in 1966 and also uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the, the background of uh, Dr. Milan Karenga and him doing time in prison and possibly being the FBI informant and things of this nature and, and the um, animosity between the organization us and the Black Panthers, what have you. Um, we, uh, personally, I don't think we should fall prey to weapons of mass distraction. We should ask the question, is Kwanzaa, after a systems analysis as opposed to a paralysis of analysis, is this good for African people? Okay, if it's good for African people, then we need to practice that. Okay, we may hold people accountable for what they did, if, uh, if they didn't atone for it, what have you, but a lot of us are majoring in the minors and focusing on personalities as opposed to the people. Okay, very important. All right, now, what are uh, first fruit celebrations? Okay, because Kwanzaa means first fruits. Uh, first fruit celebrations uh, have taken place in African history going back to uh, Kemet, the land of the blacks, which is known as ancient Egypt. Okay. Uh, you also see the term Tameri, okay, and um, it, uh, first fruit festivals also go back to Nubia, which is a Greek word, okay, when the uh, original names was uh, Tanehesi or Taseti, Taseti meaning land of the bow, because these were fierce archers, archers, okay. So you uh, have first fruit celebrations that were celebrated in African cultures, okay. First fruit celebrations occur in ancient and modern African civilizations. Also such uh, as among the Ashanti of Ghana and the Yoruba of Nigeria, okay? Uh, we can also find first fruit celebrations in large African empires like the Zulu or the Amazulu, correctly, the Amazulu of South Africa, and South Africa is also known as uh, Azania Mawini Mutapa. Um, and in some smaller uh, societies in South in Southeastern Africa, uh, like um, uh, Matabele, uh, Tonga, and Lavedu as well. So you're going to find first fruit celebrations. These are, these are not celebrations that quote unquote um, Dr. Karinga made up. These, the Kwanzaa is rooted in cultural celebrations coming out of various African cultures. Okay, this is something very important to understand. All right, now, the three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Okay, so we need to look at three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Then we'll look at uh, five uh, cultural uh, traditions throughout first fruit celebrations in Africa. And then we'll deal with the seven principles of Kwanzaa that come out of these five cultural traditions. And the seven principles are known as the Guzu Sapa. Okay. All right, now, three, three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Number one, Kwanzaa was created to reaffirm and restore our rootedness in African culture, which we have been stripped of for the most part during the Ma'afa, the great Ma'afa, the great disaster, uh, known as the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade. Okay? Kwanzaa is an expression of recovery and reconstruction of African culture. So it was taken away from us in a system, it was taken away from us, which was a system for the most part. We have still remnants of it. 
but it's not powerful like it once was. So we need to put those pieces back together as a system, okay, of culture to help restore African people back to who we were before um, interlopers come in, before the great Mahatma happens. So Kwanzaa is, is an expression of recovery and reconstruction of African culture. This is a process that was taking place in various degrees uh, uh, during the black liberation movement of the 1960s, especially with groups like Organization Us, which uh, Dr. Karinga co-founded. He was a co-founder. Uh, some people say he was the founder, but no, he was a co-founder of the organization US, just like uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson was a co-founder in 1915 of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. There were four other co-founders along with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, okay? So we need to honor those uh, ancestors as well. A lot of times, you know, we get stuck on personalities, and this is one of the problems with uh, Black History Month. We, we, we deal with personalities as opposed to the people and the movements of the people, okay? So these are things that we have to change. Okay, so very important. So this is dealing with Kwanzaa's number one created to reaffirm and restore rootedness in African culture, to reconnect African people or African Americans to African culture. All right, number two reason why Kwanzaa was created. Kwanzaa was created to serve as a regular communal celebration to reaffirm and reinforce the bonds between us as a people. Now, when you um, study work from um, uh, Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, for instance, like African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide, uh, book one and book two, okay? Uh, Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, and in some lectures I've seen of his, he talks about how uh, traditionally African people spent at least one third of the year in celebration, okay? Because they worked together, they got the work done, and they had time to celebrate, okay? They practiced one of the principles of Kwanzaa, which is Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. All right, now, Kwanzaa was created to serve as a regular communal celebration to reaffirm and reinforce the bonds between us. It was designed to be an in-gathering, a coming together, an in-gathering to strengthen community and reaffirm common identity, purpose, and directions as a people and a world community, all right? Reaffirm community identity, who are we, okay? Purpose and direction, what are we here for? What are we striving for? How do we get there, okay? Very important, common identity, purpose and direction, all right? So this is the number two reason why Kwanzaa was created. Now, number three reason why Kwanzaa was created, Kwanzaa was created to introduce and reinforce the Nguzu Saba. Nguzu Saba means seven principles, okay? The seven, uh, these seven African communitarian principles are, number one, Umoja, uh, these are Kiswahili terms, okay? Umoja, which means unity. Kujichagalia, which means self-determination. Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. Now, we've all heard the word Ujima before, even if you don't remember, even before you've heard about Kwanzaa or maybe started celebrating Kwanzaa in the 80s or something like that, okay? Um, there was an episode of Sanford's Son uh, called uh, uh, Lamont Goes African, if I remember correctly, like Lamont Goes African. So Lamont is wearing a dashiki, and uh, he meets a sister from Nigeria, and he's using African words and wants to adopt African culture. Okay, and he changes his name to Kalunda, all right, and uh, Bubba and, and Fred are, are there in the house, and uh, the Lamont says, we're going to get some Ujima in this house. And Fred said, Bubba, you, you ever heard of Ujima? I never heard of that before. And Bubba said, I never heard of uh, uh, Ujima. He said, I know Big Jima, but I never heard of Ujima. Okay, so we heard this back in the 70s. We just didn't know what it was. And they didn't mention Kwanzaa in the uh, episode, I, I, I don't know if I remember correctly, because I've seen it uh, hundred times, just like every other episode of Sanford the Sun. But um, we've heard it before, okay, so we can reference that. Okay, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, okay, is the third principle. Ujama, cooperative economics is the fourth, pr fourth principle. So cooperative economics, that relates back to economic empowerment. Here when we did deal with the pyramid analysis, okay, and we have the foundation of African history and culture, all right? So we see how this ties in. All right, number uh, five is purpose, Nia, which means purpose, okay? Number six is Kuumba, which means creativity, all right? We know African people are very creative. You, we, we have the singers and the dancers. We have the mathematicians. We have the engineers, the electricians, 
computer scientists, things like this. African people are very creative, but we have to harness our power, take control of our talents, and use those to benefit African people in this country and around the world, okay? And utilize self-determination, collective work and responsibility, unity. Unity is number one for a reason, because culture brings about unity. Okay? I never talk about we need unity, we need unity. No, we need to reclaim culture. The reason why other people, and people talk about how Jews are united and, and, and Hispanics or Mexicans and things like this, because Hispanic is a tricky term. You could be from Peru, you could be from uh, uh, Cuba, you could be from Puerto Rico, you could be my complexion and be Hispanic or darker. You can come from Cuba. I've seen some dark Cubans, but they're uh, classified as Hispanic, okay? Not quote unquote African or African American. So it's a tricky term. All right. Um, okay, Kumba, which means creativity. And last one, number seven, is Imani, which means faith. Okay, so these are the seven principles of Kwanzaa or the Nguzu Saba. Okay, now, we went through the seven principles of the Nguzu Saba. Okay, seven principles of Kwanzaa. Now, uh, when we break down these seven principles to understand what they really mean, Umoja, which means unity. Umoja means to strive for and maintain unity in the unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Okay, to strive for and and to maintain unity in the family, in our homes, our community. Okay, the nation and race. So it means across around the world. Going back to Pan Africanism. Uh, number two, Kuji Chagalia, which means self determination. To define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves and speak for ourselves, okay? And if we have leaders, these leaders need to come from the people and be chosen by the people, not chosen by Europeans with uh, wealth, not chosen by the media. Our, our uh, role models need to be, we need to define what a role model is, first of all, and the role models need to be chosen by the people, chosen by the community, not by the European controlled media. Just because somebody can dribble a basketball, just, be some, just because somebody can throw a football, or, or, or hit a baseball does not make them a role model. I don't care how many millions of dollars they have, okay? They, they, this, this does not make them a role model. And we're looking to people to be uh, role models who many of them themselves are in their early 20s. They may be womanizers, they may be uh, uh, alcoholics. Uh, and we're looking to the wrong people to be role models, okay? The first role models are your parents. All right, we're looking at people who these children don't even know to be role models, and we haven't defined as a people what a role model is. We haven't put it together a set of criteria based upon our culture to determine what a role model should be. Okay, so this goes back to self-determination. Remember, power is the ability to define and shape reality and to have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. Okay? And when we, when speaking for ourselves, when our leaders are chosen, they can't be Negro leaders and civil rights superstars who are working to keep uh, the European power structure in place and rely upon corporations to sustain them, European corporations to sustain them. Because when you look at, uh, and some of them mean well, others are nothing more than professional beggars. Some of them have good hearts, others are just in it for, the, for themselves. I'm not going to call any names. Uh, but when, when you look at most of these civil rights organizations, almost none of them have any economic program um, of any substance, okay, that will allow African people to become independent. Because if they became independent, then we wouldn't would need a lot of these organizations. A lot of these people would be out of jobs, okay, for the most part. All right, so to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. All right, now, number three, Ujima, collective work and responsibility. To build and maintain our community together and make our brothers and sisters' problems our problems and to solve them together, okay? Collective work and responsibility. We work together, we take responsibility for one another. We have to hold one another accountable as well, but we have to work together with one another build and maintain our community together, all right? Number four, Ujima, Cooperative Economics. My degree is in business administration. Taught entrepreneurship for about seven years, done business consulting for seven years. I studied entrepreneurship, economic empowerment, and African history going back to 1992. Okay, so about this, this uh, 21 years now. Okay, so Cooperative Economics is something really near and dear to me. 
to build and maintain our stores, shops, and other businesses and to profit from them together. Okay? 64% of, of the employees at African American owned businesses are other African Americans. So when we spend our dollars with our own people, we get a greater return on that investment because they're more likely to hire our own people. They're more likely to give a second chance to brothers and sisters coming back home from prison. See, it's one thing to push President Obama to end the war on drugs, but when the war on drugs ends and, and they let these brothers and sisters out who were caught up in uh, uh, selling crack cocaine and the crack disparity laws and things of this nature, what are they coming back home to? If we cannot create employment opportunities for them, if we are boycotting our own businesses, we cannot create jobs for, for our people and, and these brothers and sisters coming back home. Now, when we look at the dominant society, unemployment rate right now I think is right around 7%, maybe a little higher, something like that, uh, overall, for Europeans overall. Um, Europeans cannot create enough jobs for themselves and their children. So what do you think they're creating for you? This is one of the reasons why you had the big push for the uh, privatized prisons and the omnibus crime bill uh, back in about 1995, 1996, signed off on by Bill Clinton. And three, the three main forces that pushed uh, for this, and this instituted the truth and sentencing laws, the uh, uh, three strikes in your hour, things of this nature, were um, um, Whack and Hut, okay, privatized prison, um, and then you had uh, ALEC, American Legislative, American Legislative Exchange Council, and the Corrections Corporation of America, and uh, CCA. Uh, they're the largest uh, owner-operator of privatized prisons in the country, okay? And they're pushing for these stiffer penalties to uh, push more people into uh, the prison industrial complex so they can make more money off of them, okay? So the, uh, be sure to get the uh, lecture idea. Slavery's back in effect. The hidden relationship between the prison industrial complex, the new voter ID laws, and black population control. I break all that stuff down. All right, so cooperative economics, very important. And we have to stop boycotting our own businesses, okay? Every ethnic group in America are the largest employees of their own people, and for the most part, every ethnic group in America are the largest uh, supporters of their own businesses, okay? So we need to stop boycotting our own businesses and do like every other ethnic group does. All right, uh, number five, NIA, purpose. To make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness, okay? To make our collective vocation, okay? This is what we do, this is our vocation, this is what we're skilled in. To make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. But if you don't understand history and don't understand the traditional greatness of your people, then you won't know what your purpose should be. You won't understand the goal that we have to reach, okay? We just have to study history to realize how to get there, all right? When we understand that the Moors go into uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal in 711 AD, um, and today is known as Spain and Portugal back then as the Iberian Peninsula, they're going to introduce civilization to Europeans. They're going to introduce um, um, different types of music, mu musical instruments. They're going to introduce like the bagpipes, they're going to introduce the harp, and it's turned on the side and cased in wood, and they use uh, uh, pedals um, and, uh, or keys, and it's going to be called uh, the piano. They're going to introduce alcohol, okay? They introduce lighted streets, they put in a sanitation system, they, they, uh, they go in and build castles. We see um, movies, King, Arthur's, and King Arthur and his men, and, um, Robin Hood and things like this and see these Europeans living in castles, but these are castles that they're going to uh, take over once they expel Moors out of different parts of, of Europe. But when the Moors go in, these uh, most of the, uh, a lot of these kings and queens are living in barns. They're living in barns with the animals, okay? They're going to uh, introduce writing to many of them and teach them how to read because um, when they go in, about 90% of Europe is illiterate, okay? Uh, you had kings and queens who couldn't uh, read and write. The most literate people were the priests, okay? And they were the ones who controlled the power, who basically had the real power. You, know, look at, and you look at the church and then later the Catholic church, they're the ones that really have the power because they're controlling the information. They're, they're going to get a lot of this information that the Moors have, translate this into different languages, and put their names on it as if they wrote it themselves, put their names on it as the authors, okay? So, and they're teaching Christianity to the masses but the masses can't read and verify what they're being taught. Okay, so 
very important purpose, okay, to restore us to our traditional greatness, and, and this is why we have to study history. Okay, Kumba, creativity, okay, um, to, do, to do as always, as much as we can, in the way we can, in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it, okay, so to make it better, okay, make it better for our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. To, to do as all to do always as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. And uh, lastly, Imani, which means faith, to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Okay, so um, I would say the leaders that are doing this uh, well, not, not, some of them no, that don't believe in them. But to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our uh, leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Okay, so we have to believe that we can fly. We have to believe we can win and then study our history and lay our strategies to bring into fruition what we want to occur. Okay, but we have to set what the end result is. We have to define what freedom is, okay? Uh, many times you hear civil rights leaders um, saying that we're making progress. The question I would ask is what are we progressing towards? When has the end result been defined? Equality is very uh, ambiguous. Usually I'm talking about economic empowerment for African people. So yeah, you may be moving from point A to point B, but how are we determining whether this is uh, advantageous or beneficial for, for African people, for African Americans? What is the end result? Okay, one of the problems with uh, only studying our history from 1619 up until now is, is if the majority of what you know about your history is dealing with uh, you uh, being a slave or in slavery, then you will mistakenly think that anything that you do after slavery is somehow progress and is not. Okay, so, okay, so these are the seven principles of the Nguzu Saba. Okay, um, and the seven principles of Kwanzaa. All right, now. Okay, uh, uh, and wrapping up the three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created, the Nguzu Saba, or Seven Principles, focus on the importance of African communitarian values in general, dealing with the community. African communitarian values in general, which stress family, community, and culture, FCC, family, community, and culture, and speak to the best of what it means to be African and the first people of this planet and the indigenous people of the U.S. Okay, we go back to African people coming here going back at least 51,700 years ago. If you read the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel, no relation to me. Uh, he deals with an African presence. Page 14 of his book, he outlines it, deals with the African presence uh, found in Allendale County, South Carolina. There's overwhelming evidence showing uh, footprints in lava, M174 D haploid uh, groups. Uh, dealing with uh, genetics, uh, you have uh, structures, skeletons, uh, skulls, architecture, paintings, linguistics, metal netter writings. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence showing an African presence there. We look at African people going into South America in uh, the, the, the closest tip of South America to the closest tip of West Africa is known as Pedro Ferreira in South Africa, uh, South America. And uh, African people go there uh, at least 56,000 years ago. Uh, there's a the distance from uh, Pedro Ferreira to the closest point to West Africa is 1,550 miles, 1,550 miles, and there's a current that takes you back and forth. So um, you have African people in South America. Uh, uh, 60,000 years ago, they, they go uh, we go into Australia approximately, and if you read the uh, article from New York Times on Crete, um, uh, new evidence of uh, very ancient miners, uh, very uh, on Crete uh, evidence of very ancient mariners, okay? New York Times, 2010, February 2010. They deal with the African presence in the Greek island of Crete going back at least 130,000 years ago. They talk about Africans going into Australia 60,000 years ago. We know they're going to South America 56,000 years ago, uh, at least 51,700 years ago, uh, come to North America. Uh, and about uh, around 50,000 years ago going to Europe as well. Okay, so we can, and then uh, you have the Folsom people, which is another group of African people that uh, come here about 15,000 years ago. Dr. Claude Anderson talks about the Folsom people as well. If you read Black Labor, uh, White Wealth, uh, and also Dirty, Dirty Little Secrets, Volume 1 uh, by uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, he talks about the Folsom people. Good things happen. 
when you have an environment of commitment and dedication. Not just talked about, but lived. Lessons of our past, issues of our future. Okay, we learned a lot in, high, in school about 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and all that stuff. But you know what? There were Africans before Columbus, and we've got Dr. David Imhotep to tell us his history lesson that we need to know. Welcome, Dr. Imhotep. And I should say, you have a Ph.D. in ancient African history. That's correct. And that's, and that's kind of unusual. Yes, it is. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, how did you get interested in, in uh, this area? Uh, it was part of my dissertation uh, led this way, but I could not um, vary, vary to a, another subject when my other subject is here. So I said, later on, I will write something about that because it's not important in my dissertation at this moment. So that's why I did the book as soon as I finished my dissertation. Wow. And we should say, and we have a picture of the book, too. And it's the first Americans were Africans. And we were talking about Dr. Ivan Van Sertima because mm -hmm. I remember um, back in the 1980s, my dad took me to hear him. He came here to Cincinnati, and his book was They Came Before Columbus, and he talked about mm -hmm. you know, how Africans were here. He had a lot of, I mean, great research information, and so it was just kind of eye-opening, but we, don't, we haven't heard a lot about that recently, so tell us how you, you got involved here. Well, I'm showing that uh, we, they, Africans not only came before Columbus, they came before the Indians. So you're going even farther back. I'm going farther back, at least 56,000 years old. Okay, now we've got a graphic up here about 130,000 years ago. Yeah, well, they sailed over here. And uh, when I lecture, people say, well, wait a minute, uh, humans weren't, weren't sailing, let alone they were, weren't boating uh, 130,000 years ago. And I beg to differ. Uh, last year, New York Times uh, quoted the BBC, and uh, they wrote an article on how in Crete they have found a, a stone industry of stone tools going back to at least 130,000 years. And Crete oh. has been an island for in the middle of the, the Mediterranean for five million years. So they had to sail. And it was a continuous civilization, which means they were going back and forth. They knew how to navigate. So if they got to Crete 130,000 years ago, it's easy 70,000 years later that they could make it to the Americas at 56,000 years ago. Right. That's really... Now, how did, you, how did you even get back to this research? I mean, this is just... You know, did you start by, by reading, they came before Columbus, and then you just, you expanded on that research? Yes. You see, that was 36 years ago, uh, Dr. Van Sertima's book came out, and this information is piled on for 36 years. So many different things, so many cutting-edge articles and, and things have been found since then. Yeah, and so and what, what, what's the reaction you get when you talk about how Africans came here even before Native Americans? People are amazed. They're shocked. They're shocked. First come shocks, and then they're smiling, and some frown, of course. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and what about the school systems? Because, you know, have we gotten this information to the, to the educational system? Not yet. The only book has only been out for a month, month and a half. And what, but, kind of, what kind of feedback are you getting, though, when you go around and talk about this? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're doing lectures around the country. Yeah, well, uh, I always bring my, my peer-reviewed articles. Okay. Because my thesis, which is the same as my title, The First Americans Were Africans, is backed up by seven, soon to be eight, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, which is the height of academia. Wow. And so you've got credibility. I mean, people can see this research. What do you think? Do you think this is going to change history at all? Well, for, for hundreds of years in Europe, uh, people thought the, the, the world was flat. And it took a while for them to get it, be able to say the world was round in, in order to, to, to go out there and, and navigate and see that it was indeed round. So it's going to take a little while for them to get around this, but it will happen. Well, and tell us a little bit about these Africans who, who came before the Indians, before Columbus. <laughs> Okay, uh, they came here, and uh, they were first, uh, they ca came to uh, Tierra, uh, excuse, excuse me, um, uh, Pedro Ferreira, which is northeastern Brazil. And you'll okay. see that that's the closest point uh, from Africa to South America. And by canoe, a, a, uh, a fellow, uh, a navigator uh, who was a doctor, wanted to prove that it could be done just in a canoe. And he set out in a canoe uh, with a supply ship, but it did not touch him. He had a canoe with no oars, no, um, um, no paddle, no sail, nothing. He just sat there, and the currents took him straight from Africa to here. You've really? heard about people, if you throw a, a bottle in, in the uh, water yeah. with a note, it'll come over. Right. Yes, there are rivers in the ocean, currents. And it took him 52 days only. So you put a large sail on that vessel, wow. and you get here in less than a month. 
So it's definitely possible. We know that. It's physically possible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so what part of, of Africa were the Africans from who, who, who came to Brazil? Well, the DNA, uh, the genome, the um, genome project uh, found that the earliest ones, uh, the, the ones that they found in Tierra del Fuego, in the very tip of uh, South America, in uh, 1874, 1876, uh, were the short Africans, the Khoisan, who t spoke with the cliques, like, like that. The gods oh. must be crazy did a, uh, a movie on yeah, that. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yes. So they have About the, the Coca-Cola bottle yes. that fell in, yeah. Yes, they have the oldest DNA and the oldest language on the planet, and they were all over. Oh, wow. All over all three Americas, as now, well as now, Asia. Well, have they done any DNA tests in Brazil to see that? Yes, they have. The Genome Project went all around the world. There were 100,000 people participated. Wow. Taking DNA swabs. And so, so first we know that it's possible to get over here by, by canoe, and second of all, the DNA from that group of Africans is yes. in Brazil. The most important thing, not, not to forget to, to ask me, well, I, I will tell you that, where do the Native Americans come from? Well, we've always been taught that they came across the Bering Straits from Asia. This is true, but they did not come until 3000 BC. There is no evidence of them coming before 3000 BC. So for 53,000 years, there were nothing but Africans in North, Central, and South America. Wow. When they come over 3000 BC, those two groups, the Africans and the Mongolians, get together, the Asians, get together, and their children are the Native Americans. Wow. This is why the Native Americans do not look Chinese. They are a little different than Chinese. Right. Oh, that's, you know what, I mean, we need to, we need to learn. It makes a lot of sense, yes. Dr. Imhotep, and we need to learn our history. Yes. So I think it's fantastic that you've written this book, and I know people are wondering, how did they get the first Americans were Africans? Documented evidence, I love this, and it's by Dr. David Imhotep. How do we get this book? I have a Amazon. phone Amazon.com. Okay, Amazon.com. Yes. Okay. Well, that's easy, Amazon.com. Amazon. And Jeff is saying, give us that phone number.